Okay, let's open our Bibles. Let's go to Jude chapter 1. There's only one chapter in Jude. Jude right before Revelation. Jude chapter 1, you guys know it is not Revelations. It is Revelation, right? So Jude chapter 1, Jude, um, half-brother of Jesus, right? Okay. Um, half-brother, actually one of the brothers of Jesus, though conceived very differently. Obviously, Jesus was conceived, right? Jude was conceived naturally, right? Jesus was conceived supernaturally. So we read here, Jude, chapter 1, starting in verse 3. Jude says, Beloved, he was writing to believers, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation... I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all handed down to the saints. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. This is God's holy, authoritative, inspired word of truth. And all of God's people said, Amen. Okay. Well, as you can see here on the screen today, uh, we're continuing our series, The Doctrine of the Bible. Today, we're going to focus on this idea of interpretation. It is critical to know how to properly interpret the Bible, right? How many of you have heard people say, well, there are many interpretations of the Bible? You've heard that? Guess what? No, there aren't. There is only one interpretation. Whose interpretation? God's interpretation, right? It is our job to follow the proper principles of interpretation to try to discover what God meant by what God said to the people back then, right? Our job is to try to discover, in the power of the Holy Spirit, God's interpretation, right? So again, there's only one true interpretation, God's interpretation. Now, there are many or several applications, right? And again, that's the job of the Holy Spirit. Once we discover together what God meant by what God said, we then trust the Holy Spirit to apply that truth to believers, and many times in different ways to different believers, based upon what the Holy Spirit believes is the best application for that person, right? And that's why you notice when I preach, I don't give much application, right? My job is to help us understand the proper, to get to the proper interpretation, right? It is the Holy Spirit's job to apply that to you. Unfortunately, today, you see a lot of guys preaching. They spend about maybe a minute trying to come up with the proper interpretation, and they spend the next, what, 30, 40, 50 minutes, application, application, application. Well, you're going to have faulty application or application that's impotent, right? If you don't have the proper interpretation. And you have to be careful because you look throughout the scriptures, Old Testament, What brought down the nation of Israel? What kind of prophets? False prophets, right? That were misleading the people. Uh, New Testament. You read all the New Testament letters, including this one. What was the big battle? It was against false teachers. And that shouldn't surprise us, right? Because what did Satan do in the Garden of Eden? He tried to reinterpret or get Adam and Eve to reinterpret the command God gave. Do you see it? Try to get them to twist it. What did Satan 
try to do with Jesus when in the, in the desert or in the temptations. Second temptation, right? He quotes Psalm 91 to Jesus. Actually, he misquoted Psalm 91, right? Tried to twist the improper interpretation. So we see in the Garden of Eden him doing that and succeeding against Adam and Eve. We see him in the desert trying to do that with Jesus. Didn't succeed, right? We see that he did that in the Old Testament with the people of Israel. He succeeded. We see that he was trying to do that in the New Testament in the early churches. What do you think he's been doing throughout church history? He masquerades as what? An angel of light. He is the father of lies. And what is he trying to get us to do? To have faulty interpretation of scripture. Make sense? That's why Jude here says, in verse 3, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you, about our common salvation, he wanted to write to the believers uh, rejoicing in their life with God through Jesus Christ. He goes, that's what I wanted to do. Obviously, the Holy Spirit, who inspired this letter through Jude, obviously redirected Jude. And that's why Jude said, well, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you, what are the next two words? Contend earnestly, underline those words, that you contend earnestly for, what are the next two words? The faith, underline those words, that you contend earnestly for the faith, which was, what are the next three words? Once for all, underline those three words, handed down to the saints, to the believers, right? Right? So James says, although I wanted to write you about this, our common salvation, here's why, what I'm actually writing you. I felt the necessity, obviously the compulsion by the Holy Spirit, to write to you, appealing to you, begging you, warning you, encouraging you to do what? To contend earnestly. You want the Greek word? The Greek word is ep. Agonosomai. Ep agonosomai. Contend earnestly, one Greek word. Ep agonosomai. Agonosomai, it's where we get our English word what? Agonize, right? Now, you add ep on the Greek to that at the beginning, the prefix, it makes it even stronger. Basically, the way it's structured, this word ep agonosomai, it's in the present infinitive. I know that bores you when it comes to grammar, but it's very important. Here's what he's saying. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to contend earnestly. I want you to ep agonosomai continuously and vigorously. That's the present infinitive. I want you to agonize. For what? Well, you underline two other words. For what? the faith. He's not talking here about saving faith. He is talking about the truth, the objective truth of God. So Jude is saying to the believers, I want you to agonize vigorously strenuously, continuously. I want you to agonize for this. Uh, Paul talks about, I have fought the good fight of the faith, right? I fought the good faith fight. I've run the race, right? I've kept the faith. That's what he's talking about here. So Jude says, I want you to contend earnestly, ep agonosomai, for the faith, God's written revelation, which by the way he says, 
was once for all handed down to the saints. Once for all, Greek word, you guys know it? Hapax, very good. Hapax, it means once for all time given. Uh, Hapax, completed, right, in time with lasting results. Uh, Christ, um, uh, scripture talks about um, that he sacrificed himself once for all time, hapax, right? A completed event with lasting results. Christ sacrificed himself once for all time. Does Christ re-sacrifice himself now? No, why? Because hapax, once for all. When it comes to scripture, what's God saying about scripture? That's it, once for all time given. Do we add to scripture? Do we take away from scripture? Do we believe in all kinds of revelations outside of scripture? No, that's new revelation, right? God says his scripture is hapax, right? Once for all time given. Given, right? In time, completed, lasting results. And, J and Jude says, as believers, you better strenuously, vigorously, and continuously fight for this and it is a battle am I right because the evil one the father of lies is trying to get people either not to read the scripture obviously or if they're reading it to have faulty interpretation make sense in fact in the context why, why was Jude saying that believers had to agonize for the scriptures which has been once for all given? Look what he says in verse 4. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Can I ask you a question? Where do they creep into? The church. These are servants of Satan. Masquerading as servants of righteousness. These are false teachers. What have they done? They have crept in unnoticed. By the way, did they just blast through the doors and say, hi, I'm a false teacher. Be aware. I'm going to try to get you messed up on interpretation. Is that, is that what they did? They crept in, right? They crept in unnoticed. Jude said those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, they're ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. And if you want to read more about these false teachers and the various descriptions Jude gives of them, I mean, it's nuts. Nuts in that these people have absolutely no shame. And that's because they are tools of Satan. And these are people who stand in the pulpit. And these are people that are giving wrong interpretations of Scripture. These are people who are changing the scriptures, adding to the scriptures, taking away from the scriptures, giving a picture of a different Jesus, not the Jesus of the Bible. They are denying, as Jude said, our only master and Lord. And these are people empowered by Satan who have crept into the church and they are false teachers. And they were trained in Satan's seminary. That's why, as a believer, you better learn how to agonize for the truth. It's been once for all given. And you cannot fall into the trap of maybe reinterpreting the Bible editing the Bible. Coming up with your own opinions about the Bible. Teaching what you want to teach about the Bible or what you think that the people want to hear. You're falling into the trap. You're not agonizing. You're compromising. And you're on the wrong team then, right? Right? 
So it's pretty clear when it comes to the truth. What do you have to do? Strenuously, vigorously, and continuously make sure that you are interpreting the scriptures correctly. When I was in seminary, I never thought that would be my big battle. Right? I mean, when I was in seminary, I said, okay, well, if... Okay, I'm going to be a pastor. If God calls me a pastor one day, I'm going to preach in the church and everybody's going to open their Bibles and everybody's going to understand that which I'm teaching and it's just going to be this wonderful, beautiful thing, right? I figured my big battle would be out with the non-believers, trying to preach the gospel to them and, and you know, uh, you know uh, presenting them the bad news and the good news and so forth. That's what I thought my battle would be. I never dreamt that my big battle would be in the church. Basically, holding on to this strenuously as people in the church are pulling it. And as Martin Luther said, treating God's word is kind of like, um, uh, like clay, and just twisting it and shaping it into whatever image they feel. I never thought that I would be sitting there battling in the church. But again, look what creeps into the church. Right? And so, we need to understand today the principles of interpretation. How do you properly interpret the Bible? Because ultimately, that's the agonizing, right? Discovering the truth, that which God meant by, which God, by what God said, and holding on to it, right? Well, Today, we're going to take a look at three principles of interpretation. And by the way, I'm going to let you in a little hint, okay? None of these three principles start out with, this is what the Bible means to me. Do you understand what I just said? Don't ever read something in the Holy Scriptures and immediately say, well, this is what this passage means to me. I'm sorry. Did God write that passage first and foremost to you? No. So you don't start with that. What you want to do, principle number one, is interpret the Bible as it is written. You need, you do interpret the Bible literally right? As it is written, the literal, grammatical, historical method. Let me repeat those three. Write them down. Literal, grammatical, historical method. You interpret the Bible as it is written. A noun is a noun. A verb is a verb. This is the key right here. Write this down. Old Testament. Five books, it's the law, written by Moses, right? Twelve books are called the historical books, from Joshua to Esther. You've got five books called the wisdom or poetry writings. Psalms. The Song of Songs. Five major prophets. 
Isaiah through Daniel. Twelve minor prophets from Hosea to Malachi. There's your Old Testament, 39 books. New Testament, you've got the four Gospels. We'll talk about the life of Christ. You've got the book of Acts that shows the launching of the church of Christ. Or you could say shows the, the works of the spirit of Christ. You've got the New Testament letters or epistles, right? That show writing to uh, the people of Christ, how they were to live. And then you've got the book of Revelation that talks about the second coming of Christ. Now, why did I have you write this down? You interpret the Bible as it is written. How would you interpret, let's say, the book of Joshua, which fits into the category of the 12, what kind of books in the Old Testament? Historical. How would you interpret Joshua? Historically. So, when we see that the sun stood still in Joshua, how do we interpret that? Sun stood still. God can do that, right? Uh, how do we interpret when uh, big hailstones came down from heaven uh, or out of the sky, obviously empowered by God in heaven, uh, and you know, crush the enemies? How do you interpret that? Historically, right? Because that's you're interpreting the book of Joshua as it is written. It is a in a, a historical account of God's people entering and conquering in the promised land. Make sense? And that's why, again, you don't want to vary. If it's a historical book, you interpret it as it is, historical writing. Um, Song of Solomon. Poetry, right? Wisdom. So we, we see in the Song of Solomon uh, a lot of like interesting images where Solomon talks about his bride-to-be, that she has teeth like, um, uh, well, how do you describe their teeth? Like milk? Uh, uh, huh? Yeah, it's all, yeah, all kinds of, you know, these different, well, how do you, I mean, was he about to marry a, white, a woman who, whose teeth were big and white like this? No. So you interpret Song of Solomon in those certain areas. How? They're poetic, right? Now, it was an actual historical event where Solomon was marrying a Shumite woman, right? So we know that. But when you start to see, you don't want to like all of a sudden get this picture of, um, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, what kind of woman was he marrying? She was like a freak or something, right? No. Why do I say that? Song of Solomon has often been misinterpreted as an allegory. A picture of Christ's love for the church. Now, does Christ love his church? Of course he does. He, Ephesians 5, he gave himself up for his church, right? But if you start to allegorize the Song of Solomon and you put Christ in there, oof. Because Solomon gives some very vivid and intimate uh, descriptions of his desires for his new bride. You don't want those words to be Christ's words for his church. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's where you start to have all kinds of faulty interpretation. Ezekiel, Old Testament. There are parts that are historical, obviously, right? But a large portion of Ezekiel is what? Apocalyptic? talking about things to come. So when we see in Ezekiel chapter 1, Ezekiel had this vision of this like really incredible kind of carriage and 
buzzing around and all this stuff. He calls it the glory of God. You don't take that and paint a picture of God according to that image, right? It was very symbolic. Apocalyptic literature is very symbolic. What Ezekiel was saying in Ezekiel chapter 1 is not a literal, it wasn't giving us a literal picture of God. He was giving us this symbolic picture of the greatness, the awesomeness, the holiness of God. Does that make sense? And again, you have to interpret the Bible as it is written. Right? Do an exercise. Go over to Revelation chapter 1. This is John, the apostle on the island of Patmos. And he had this incredible vision of the resurrected and glorified Christ. And John heard this voice behind him speaking, and he turned around, and he, and he had this picture of Christ, the glorified Christ. And he describes, and look at verse 14. Christ's head and his hair were white like wool, like snow. Um, is that how Christ looks in his glorified state? Does he look like this glorified Santa Claus? Um. Christ's eyes were like a flame of fire. Does Christ have these like, like darting, like flaming, like eyes like that? Like you see on some of these like uh, uh, movies that come out now, the, the, these cartoon characters. Um, his feet were burnished bronze that were glowing, in a, like made to glow like in a furnace. Is that how Christ's feet look? His voice was like the sound of many waters. Like, is, is, that, is that how Christ? Book of Revelation. What kind of genre? Apocalyptic. Highly what? Symbolic. Do you see it? You interpret this as it is written. What did John see? The awesomeness of Christ. His authoritative word, his voice, like the sound of many waters. His burning, blazing eyes that see everything. His omniscience. His bronze feet glowing like in a furnace. Purifying everything he steps on judgment his head white as snow holiness purity do you see it because again if you don't interpret this the way it's written all of a sudden you're going to have all kinds of people coming up with their own cool pictures and images of Jesus that's idolatry But go to Matthew 4, a text we've been studying recently on the Lord's Day. Starting in verse 18, Now as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishermen. He said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother in the boat with Zebedee their father. Mending their nets, he called them. Immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. How should we interpret this? Literally, right? Well, interpret it as it is written. What is it? Gospel. The life of Christ. So did Christ, was Christ actually walking? Did he actually see Peter and Andrew? Did he actually see James and John? Did he see Peter and Andrew casting a net out into the sea? Did he see James and John with their father Zebedee uh, mending the nets? Did Jesus actually call four actual fishermen to follow him? Yes or no? Yes. You see? You interpret it as it is written. 
That means you need to know the genre of the scriptures, right? And you need to be careful to not interpret something the way it is not written, right? Because that's how you come up with heresy. So you need to know the five books of the law. You need to know the historical context, right? You need to know through whom God inspired those words, to whom God was speaking. Where were they? What were the people doing? Why was God speaking to them? That's how you properly know the context. And there, then you can properly interpret it as it is written. Make sense? Good. Principle number two, interpret the Bible with the Bible. You hear me say this all the time. You see when I teach, what am I doing? I'm always interpreting the Bible with the Bible. Who inspired the scriptures? Holy Spirit, right? Well, who better to teach us uh, the interpretation than the Holy Spirit? So we're always interpreting scripture with scripture. The reformers called that analogia scriptura. This is the chief rule of interpretation. Let the scriptures interpret the scripture, right? So for instance, go to um, uh, go to First Timothy. First Timothy, um, starting in verse three, the apostle Paul writing to Timothy and look what he says to him. As I urged you upon my departure for Macedonia, remain on at where? Ephesus, so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines. Stop. Well, this verse means to me, eh. well, I think, eh. first of all, what's our genre here? What? Yeah, it's Paul writing to a literal person named Timothy who was pastoring a literal church in Ephesus. So you interpret as it is written. So, Paul says, I left you there in Ephesus on my way to Macedonia because I want you to instruct or command certain men not to teach strange doctrines. Right? Now, I want to know more why, as to why Paul was commanding Timothy to do that. So, what do I do? Well, analogia scriptura. You're already starting it, right? Where are you going to go? Book of Acts. Because again, the book of Acts, right, is we see the Holy, the Spirit of Christ, right, planting churches of Christ. Is there anywhere in Acts where we see a church in Ephesus? Sure there is. Acts chapter, where? Um, no, did you say 20? Yes, go to 20, right? Acts chapter 20. All right, here we are. This is the Apostle Paul speaking to the Ephesian elders. And look what Paul said. Verse 28, to the elders before he departed from there. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you what? Overseers. To shepherd the church of God, 
which he purchased with his own blood. By the way, again, you see the, the Trinity right there. It's the church of God, the Father, purchased by the precious blood of the Son, of which God, the Holy Spirit, makes men overseers, elders, shepherds of the church. And why is it that Paul said to the elders in the church of Ephesus, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock? Look what he says in verse 29. I know that after my departure, who's going to come in? Savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Savage wolves or what? Teachers, false teachers, right? Jesus said in Matthew uh, 7, right? Okay, he referred to them as wolves, right? In sheep's clothing, false teachers. So Paul is warning the elders, be careful because false teachers are going to want to come in from the outside. But then he said, verse 30, and from among your own selves, men will arise. What's he saying there? False teachers are not just going to come from the outside, but from where else? Inside, among the elder board. And they're going to try to draw disciples after them, draw away disciples after them. Therefore, verse 31, Paul says, be on the alert, remembering that night and day, for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. Now go to 1 Timothy Chapter 1, verse 3, Paul says to Timothy, as I urged you, upon my departure for Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus. Why? So that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines. What was Paul saying to Timothy? Get rid of the wolves. They showed up. In fact, we know the names of two of the wolves. Go over to verse 20. Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom Paul said before he went to Macedonia, he had to hand these guys over to Satan, excommunicate from the church, so they'd be taught not to blaspheme. Oh, wait a second, Andrew. Uh, how, how do you know these guys were, were elders? Remember Acts 20? What did Paul say? Even from your own number, men will arise. Boom, there are two wolves right there. You see where we get it from? You interpret scripture with scripture. Well, Andrew, how do you know they're elders? Uh, chapter three, qualifications of an elder, end of verse two. All the qualifications of the elder here have to do with his man's character, except one thing. Look at the end of verse two. He has to be able to what? Teach. Now go back to chapter one, verse three. We put it together. As I urge you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus, that you may instruct certain men... Not to what? Teach strange doctrines. Who was Paul or uh, uh, Timothy responsible to uh, get rid of in that church? False teaching male elders. Men who did not heed the warning earlier in Acts 20. Does that make sense? Do you see how you interpret Scripture with Scripture? Right? Right? And you guys are getting very good at that. I watch how you preach now. You're doing very... Look, I remember when I was in seminary, a book came out. Um, um, illustrations to use in your sermons. So there was like a book that came out. Okay, this is before the internet days. <laughs> uh, illustrations for your sermons. And so there were all kinds of illustrations that, I don't know, whoever wrote the book put in there and then as a pastor or a preacher right if you're looking to like really bring home a point right you just pull out one of those illustrations and you just maybe can shape it and mold it and it kind of fits for your story maybe put your name in it or whatever i mean that's not actually a very good thing to do <laughs> illustrations to kind of drive home the point why not illustrate the bible with the bible Do you guys understand now? First Timothy right here? This point right here? You see what we did? We just illustrated with Acts 20. 
compare, uh, 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 interpret Scripture with Scripture, right? And that's what you do even when it comes to difficult, difficult verses, which is our third principle. Interpret the implicit with the what? Explicit. That which is maybe obscure or not clear, a verse, don't make doctrine on it. Back away from it. Expand now out and look for places in Scripture that are very explicit, very clear, that speak to that very verse or topic that maybe is a bit implicit. What do I mean by that? Go to 1 John. I think we actually did this on a Q&A. Um, I don't know when, but it's good to repeat it sometimes, right? All right, here we go. 1 John chapter 2. Uh, verses 1 and 2. The Apostle John writing to believers. He says, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone sins, we do have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation, the one who appeased, satisfied God's wrath. He is the propitiation for our what? Sins. Not for our sins only, but also for those of the what? Whole world. Stop. What does it sound like right there? Jesus died for everyone. Well, if Jesus died for everyone, obviously everyone goes to heaven, right? That's called universalism, right? There's no hell. No one in hell. Everybody goes to heaven. God's love wins, right? That's what the verse says. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. Well, obviously the whole world then goes to heaven, right? No? Oh, that means that Jesus died for the whole world, but that means if the whole world doesn't go to heaven, if there are some people to go to hell, but yet Jesus died for their sins, oh my, that means Jesus failed. I guess he didn't do a good enough job. I guess he didn't really satisfy or appease God's wrath. You see the problem? Right now, this verse seems like it's teaching universalism, right? He died for the sins of the whole world. So, let me say it this way. It looks like, based on that verse, Jesus died for the whole world. Either you have to believe in universalism, the whole world goes to heaven. Or if you don't believe in universalism, based on this verse, you got to go, Jesus failed. He died for everybody, but not everybody goes to heaven. Jesus failed. Do you see the problem? So, you look at this verse and you better back away from it very quickly. And you better not make doctrine on the implicit. You better go through the scriptures and find places where it tells us for whom Jesus died. You look for the explicit. Does that make sense? Let me show you what I mean. Go to Matthew chapter 1. The angel Gabriel announcing to Joseph that Mary was going to con uh, bear a son, uh, conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 21, jo uh, Gabriel says to Joseph, she will bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus. Why? For he will save, what's the pronoun? His people from their sins. Now, right here, we see an angelic announcement. And we see that this idea of saving the whole world 
is not in that announcement. He will save his people. What's the next logical question? Who are his people? Let's go to Matthew 25. Well, we're going to see a picture of judgment day, aren't we? Starting in verse 31. We're told that, and these are the words of Jesus, by the way, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him. He will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the what? Sheep from the goats. Who's the shepherd? Jesus. Sheep and goats. There's going to be a separation, right? And he will put his sheep on which side? Right side. And he'll put the goats on the which side? Left side. Then, verse 34, the king will say to those on the right, who's he talking to here, the sheep? Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Who goes to heaven here? Sheep. Let's keep going. He says, I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you invited me in. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous, these are the ones on the right, the sheep, will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it for one least of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Verse 41. Then the king will say to those on his left, who's this? Who are these people? The goats. Depart from me, accursed ones, into the what? Eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. I guess Jesus didn't preach universalism, did he? By the way, fire, it's eternal. It lasts forever. Jesus said, verse 42, for I was hungry, you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, you did not invite me in. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they, then they themselves, the goats, will answer, Lord, will, by the way, notice they called him Lord. Um, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison, did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these. You didn't do it for me. Then these, the goats, will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous, the sheep, into eternal life. Okay, so watch, watch, watch. Jesus came to save everybody, or what was the pronoun? His people, right? Pretty clear, right? Pretty explicit. We see here in Matthew 25 a picture, right? Sheep and goats. Sheep go where? Heaven. Goats go where? Hell. Okay, now we're getting a picture, right? We're getting a picture. It's pretty explicit, right? Go to John chapter 10. Verse 11. What does Jesus say? I am the good shepherd. Remember the, picture, the idea of the shepherd in Matthew 25? Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for whom? The sheep. For the goats? No, for the sheep. Um, hop over to uh, verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my own my own know me, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Now, he gives us an idea, verse 16. By the way, he says, I have other sheep, which are not of this fold. I must bring them also. Who's he talking about here? Gentiles, right? Because in this context, you're speaking to Jews. He says, I lay down my life for the, for the sheep. But he says, but I've got other sheep who are not of this pen. I must bring them also. Jews and Gentiles. 
And he says, I must bring them also. They will hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd. Now go to 1 John chapter 2. And we read verses 1 and 2. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not only our, for ours, but also for those of the whole world. What is John saying there? What's that? There you go. The sheep, just the Jewish sheep? Sheep in the whole world. Right? Again, John, Jewish, an apostle, right? The Jews were the chosen people. John here is making the point. That, again, Christ is, our, is the propitiation for our sins in that immediate context, right? But he says, just not ours, but also for the sins of the whole world, meaning every single person? No, meaning every single what? Sheep, Right? For whom did Christ die? The sheep, not the goats. I know that's a tough pill for people to swallow. Oh, that doesn't seem fair. Really? Doesn't seem fair. This seems fair to you. He who knew no sin became sin for us. So that we, the sinners, could have life with God. Because of the righteousness of Christ imputed to our account, that seems fair. No, if you want fair, guess what? You go to hell. That's fair. That's what I deserve, right? That's what you deserve. That's justice. Wages of sin is death. No, we don't want fair. We want mercy. We want grace. But here's the deal. If you want mercy and grace, if you want God's love, God has to first deal with your sins. Because he's also just. And how did he do it? He raised up a substitute, his beloved son. The perfect one of heaven became man. The perfect God man went to the cross. And as he hung there, God the Father took the sins of whom? His people. And placed them on Jesus. And punished Jesus in their place. Whose place? His people. Right? Who did Jesus lay down his life for? The sheep. Jesus died, but three days later, he rose in victory, paying for the sins in full in terms of that day of judgment. The sins of whom? His people, Matthew 121. Gabriel said to Joseph, you shall call him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Do you see it? So, and by the way, who goes to heaven? Sheep or goats? Sheep. Who did Jesus lay down his life for? Sheep or goats? Sheep. Just Jewish sheep? No. Jesus said, I have other sheep in the pen. I must bring them also. That's what John is saying here. Christ is the propitiation of our sins. Not just ours only, but for the whole world. Not every person who's ever lived, but the chosen sheep. Right? So you take the implicit. You look at that at first and go, oh, universalism? Well, it's not universalism. If Jesus died for everybody. Not everybody goes to heaven. Uh, we got a problem. What happened? 
you take the implicit and you interpret it with the explicit. Look how easy it was, easy it was for you to answer the questions I was asking. Because we saw the explicit, right? So, this is how you interpret the Bible. You do not try to bring the Bible into this modern time. You take this modern time as a pastor. I don't try to bring the Bible to you to make it re relevant. The Bible's already relevant. It's the inspired, inerrant word of God. It's boundless. It's timeless. It's limitless. There are no boundaries to God's word. There's no like, well, God says, I, insert, I, I inspired it for this time, but you as humans now have to make it more relevant. What? That's where faulty interpretation comes from. And you can tell when a guy is doing that. He'll read a text, if he even chooses to do that, and he immediately puts himself and the people in that text without explaining the historical context. So it's by taking the Bible out of its historical context, you are immediately opening yourself up to faulty interpretation. Immediately. Right? Uh, I saw something on, on the internet of, of, of a preacher, well-known preacher. Uh, well, you, guys, you guys were here when I, well, obviously, uh, when I preached uh, recently on Jesus in Nazareth, remember? Jesus preaching in Nazareth. They did like a five-part series on that, right? Remember that? And how the people responded and all that? Well, this guy was preaching on that too. But he immediately, he read the text and immediately was like, have you ever felt like you were in Nazareth? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You deal with people who are fickle and one minute they like you, the next minute they don't. Um, I'm sorry. No, I wasn't there with Jesus in Nazareth. Were you? What? So he preaches this sermon. He puts himself in Nazareth. No, Jesus was there. The story's about Jesus. It's not about you, preacher. The story's about what those people did to Jesus. It's not what people do to you, preacher. You see what I'm saying? And so... He didn't explain any of the historical context. He just takes, he brings the Bible up and tries to make it relevant. And the people have no clue what God meant by what God said to those people in that time. So there was no interpreting the Bible as it's written. There was no interpreting the Bible with the Bible. There was no interpreting the implicit with the explicit. He didn't even go through, you know, the part where, where Jesus uh, uh, really ripped into the people of Nazareth in a synagogue when he, refer, uh, when he says the prophet's not welcome in his hometown. We understand what that means because taught, I taught on it, right? And, and then he used the illustration of um, in the Old Testament during the times of Elijah and Elisha. By the way, two prophets who weren't. Look how you're all nodding your heads. You remember. Why? We didn't bring the Bible and try to make it relevant to you. Where you go, I don't even know who Elijah and Elisha are. I don't even know what he's talking about there. I took you back there. My goal was to put you in that synagogue in Nazareth with them. I wanted you to understand the historical context. Why was Jesus there? Where is Nazareth? Well, why was he preaching, you know, the, the spirit of the Lord is upon me? Da, da, da. Well, where did that come from? We need to go back to then. And we need to understand what God meant by what God said to them. And once you understand and interpret that text accurately, then you can bring principles and apply them to your life, right? Faulty interpretation is laziness. It's slothfulness, as R.C. Sproul said. 
and it's sin. You are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. You fail to follow the proper principles of interpretation, you're not loving God with your mind. In fact, you are distorting God's holy word. And guess who tries to do that? Satan. You interpret the Bible as it is written. You better know the genre. You better know the historical context, the language, the geography, the situation. You need to dive into those times. You better know the grammar, the length, all of that. You interpret the Bible with the Bible. The Holy Spirit who inspired the word is the perfect interpreter of his word. And you just keep revving up the engine and interpret the Bible with the Bible. And you take the implicit and you never make doctrine on the implicit. You look for the explicit throughout that will help you properly interpret the implicit. It's only about 500 years ago, right here in Europe, that there was a German monk by the name of Martin Luther who stood all alone. And he had the audacity to say that the Catholic Church and, and the Catholic Church councils and the Pope were not the full and final authority when it came to God's Word. Because you see, back then, and even today, unfortunately, the church had said that the church and only the church is the interpreter of the Bible. Well, as you know, their interpretation was a free-for-all. They used all kinds of faulty interpretive principles. including one of the most horrific called allegory, which looks for the hidden meaning below the literal meaning. Well, Martin Luther had the audacity to say the Bible is the final authority and that Scripture interprets Scripture. And that there's only one true interpretation, God's interpretation. Well, Martin Luther got called to a trial. 1521, it was called the Diet of Worms. Okay, it wasn't some like newfangled diet how he could learn how to lose weight by eating worms, right? You do understand that, right? Diet, council, worms, the place. And it was there that Martin Luther, his writings, his books that talked about the absolute authority of God's word. His writings were put out on a big table and the big wigs there said, Martin, are those your books? Yeah. Question number two. Will you recant, recant everything you wrote? Because if you don't, there's going to be big trouble. Well, Martin Luther asked for a night to think it over. I mean, he was by himself. He was surrounded by church authorities. His life was on the line. And it's because he said that the church is not the interpreter of Scripture. God's Word is. Well, the next morning, Martin Luther showed up. Again, the two questions were asked. Martin, are these your writings? Yes, they are. Martin, will you recant? He said, absolutely not. And he said, unless I am convicted by Scripture and plain reason, 
I do not accept the authority of popes and councils for they have contradicted each other when it comes to the interpretation of Scripture. My conscience is captive to the Word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything. For to go against conscience is neither right or safe. God help me. Amen. The Reformation. Where are the people today who are going to properly interpret Scripture? Who are going to stand strong even if they have to stand alone on Scripture? Who are willing to die for and yes, to live for and yes, even die for. God's holy word. Remember what Jude said? Contend earnestly. Ep agonosamai. For the faith. The body of truth. Objective truth given by God. Once for all time, a box. This guy, Martin Luther, ep agonosamai. John Calvin, ep agonosamai. John Knox, Charles Spurgeon. Where's the next generation? Who's willing to contend earnestly and properly interpret God's holy word?